Hi, everyone, and welcome to this second webinar in our State of the Industry series, uh, where today we're going to be looking at what the best new growth opportunities for telcos are, how to identify them, how to build them and scale them. And we have a great panel here who I'll introduce uh, in a moment. So a quick uh, bit of housekeeping before we get on to all the exciting stuff for the day today. Um, as the audience, you guys are all in listen-only mode. You guys are muted. But if you have any questions, uh, please do submit them throughout the panel. We'll be taking questions as we go along. We won't wait till the end. So do you know put them in when you think of them, and, and we'll address them as we go along. So you can use the questions panel for that. Uh, the other thing is that we will be sharing the slides and the recording of this webinar. So if you want to share it with a colleague or you know, you're having technical difficulties, there's a limited amount of what we can do to support you with your technical difficulties during the session, but we will record it so you can come back to it at a later time or catch the, the slides later. So I think those are the main housekeeping points. And the agenda for today. So we'll do some introductions of the series and of our great panel. And then we all do a bit of a presentation looking at some of the new opportunities that we've identified through our research at STL Partners, um, looking at remote working and looking at the digital health market. And then we'll open up uh, for the most of the session to a panel discussion with Annette and Lisa who have lots of experience in this field and have, I know from speaking to them in prep sessions and before this, that they have lots of great insights to share with us. So introductions. Um, this is uh, the State of the Industry webinar series. And the whole idea of what we're doing here is obviously Mobile World Congress is not happening. And I don't know about you guys, but for us at SPL, it's always a great opportunity to have some really interesting conversations about you know what's been happening where do you see the market going what are the you know top of mind challenges um, or topics that you're thinking of and just kind of you know you do it over a coffee yes it's really busy but it's nice to see people so we're trying to recreate that a little bit with this webinar series and talk about some of the big things that are top of mind for us and and i think that the industry as a whole is really thinking about well we need to build some new value either building on top of our connectivity services, make, you know, enhancing them, you know, looking into a platform business model around 5G and edge. And that'll be the topic for tomorrow particularly. But a lot of the challenges around building new opportunities is really how do you find them? How do you identify them? How do you prioritize what to invest in? How do you scale that up once you've found something that's good? Um, and so that's really what we're gonna dive into today. Uh, so I would like uh, to introduce my panel. Um, so I have here with me today Lisa Puranen from Elisa. Lisa, do you want to give us a, a brief intro, please? Yes, of course. So today I'm responsible for the brand and customer experience and new startups in our international digital services. And before this role, I have uh, done over 10 years I think most experiments with new startups than anyone else in Ellis I would think so starting scaling failing exiting all possible business areas in my background great look forward to diving into detail and Annette yes uh, thank you Amy uh, I'm Annette Bouman uh, I work with Telia uh, and I'm part of the group strategy team but uh, work and dedicate most of my time uh, with uh, Division X, which is, which is a growth unit uh, for scaling emerging bets within Telia. And I have a long background uh, within uh, telecom and media, I would say, uh, working with especially driving new business areas within these fields. Great, thank you so much. Well, really looking forward to, to hearing from you guys today. And as I say, you know, to the audience, please submit your questions because I'm sure I won't have thought of all of them. So a quick presentation from me um, and Annette and Lisa, you know, please do comment as we go along to, to see how you're looking at these opportunities or, or not. So as a starting point, yesterday we shared a lot of um, results from a recent survey that we've done looking at the telecoms industry's investment priorities. So this survey 
uh, was completed by about 144 people. Um, and that was people from within telecoms operators, within vendors, and you know, from analysts and consultants like myself. And, and so a little bit of a split. And what we asked them was, we asked across a number of different areas, do you think that this particular area you'll see a big budget lift, a big acceleration of investment or a, a launch of a new service? Do you think you'll see a minor acceleration? You don't see any change. You'll see a minor delay or drop or you'll see a big delay or drop. And that's what we asked them. And that, those are the weighted scores that we're showing here. So yesterday we discussed a lot of the topics on, on this um, graph that I'm sharing with you now, you know, particularly transformation programs um, and a number of the other ones that, that are top of mind for, for telecoms operators or for the industry more broadly. Today, we're gonna dive into a few of them in more detail. So I think that you know, when I'm looking at digital health and, and the remote working, there's a big security services component to that. Um, obviously, it's a small part of the security market, but we'll dive into that. And then the discussion will focus more around this understanding customer needs and innovation and development, both of which are obviously top of mind. So when we're thinking about remote working, for me, this is an area that holds a lot of opportunity for all telecoms operators. And connectivity is one part of how do you improve remote working. Um, and that's you know, connectivity to the home. So uh, obviously, you know, for those of you in the Nordics, this is a little bit less of an issue, but in many other um, countries and regions, this is still a big issue. How do you get connectivity to the home if it's not fiber? Then how do you um, support that with fixed wireless access or other mobile options or um, a combination of, of fixed and mobile? But to the home. And then there's also the question of in the home. Once you're in the home, how do you distribute that connectivity effectively, especially if you have more than one remote worker, if you have, um, you know, competing things with kids at home who are doing uh, online learning or, you know, entertainment. So how do you manage that in the home? And you can see here, this is just, you know, a survey um, that I pulled, which, which I didn't do, but it's from October last year and thinking about what are IT managers most worried about in terms of supporting remote workers. And as you see, the poor, poor home internet bandwidth is, is the first one. And the second one is the increased security and compliance risks. So that's another major issue. But I think the other things that are you know, challenging for businesses, particularly small ones that don't have a huge IT department is, you know, how do you manage the, the setting people up and um, supporting home workers who need help and uh, identifying what the right solution is for what the right person is. And I think that, you know, telecoms operators have a strong role to play here. They're already, they're already in there in a lot of ways. And so it's a question of enhancing what they already offer. So we did some research on this. And the first thing that really came out is that there are very different needs um, amongst home workers. So on the far left, we've, we've sort of categorized them into these four personas. And on the far left, we've call this the direct cloud user and that's really most of the market you know you're using work applications that are cloud-based already um, you have a pretty high tolerance for disruption to your network um, because you're not doing anything you know too too sensitive or time sensitive and and your data sensitive sensitivity is low but then there are people you know you kind of scale up that get need have more needs so if you're secure her remote worker, you might be handling some sensitive data, you might need access to internal systems. Um, and that means that you need some additional security. You might need the ability to prioritize traffic, you might need the ability to separate traffic um, and, and, and you know, better endpoint security. And then you kind of go up a level where you're more of a Soho branch. And this, you might be handling even more sensitive data. And you, lower tolerance to, to network disruption. And, and that's where the opportunity comes in to have a failover service, right? So you might have a, um, a very good fixed connectivity, but what if that falls out? You need a, a quick mobile fallover to handle that traffic and you need some more advanced security services up to the very top layer here. And I think that you know these upper layers are not the biggest part of the market now, but if we can serve them properly, they might grow. We don't know exactly what the home working environment is going to look like over the future, but if you're thinking about, you know, sensitive data, like if you're a healthcare worker or if you're in financial services or, you know, 
there are really good reasons to have better security and ability to separate out this traffic that telecoms operators can serve. Obviously, this is a little bit of a, a challenge to deliver, but what we're seeing in the market is kind of bringing the principles of SD-WAN into the work from home service. So you combine an underlay of whatever connectivity that you can get to make sure that you're delivering that most reliable service possible from a connectivity perspective, and then overlaying with the enterprise grade services. So that's the security, additional VPNs, SD1, higher SLAs, and the ability to monitor. And so I think that that's what we're starting to see in the market. And an example of that is that AT&T has something like this, which is called Anira, um, which is a kind of a, a Soho SD1 service. And they reported that in the beginning of lockdown, sales for that, for that service jumped 700%. That's, that's a big growth in demand. And effectively what they're offering is this additional security and this additional flexibility. And taking this approach means that telecoms operators can meet the different needs within an enterprise effectively. And so the key factors where we feel that telcos can differentiate here is on, on friction. So that's in terms of you know, the, how easy it is to use the, the network you know, performance within the household. Um, the second is performance, um, sort of the quality of the network overall and the sort of mobile, mobile failover and um, ensuring that it's, it's meeting the needs for, for whatever applications are running within the household on different devices. Uh, security, and that's not, there are loads of different types of security, right? So you're thinking about the endpoint, the Wi-Fi equipment, um, about the on-ramp into cloud applications, um, in malware. So there are a lot of different areas of security that you can build on. And finally, the implementation. And I think this is thinking about the cost of delivering this type of stuff. So how do you make it cost effective? How do you make it easy for enterprises to top up what consumers already have in their homes? Or how do you make it easy to um, handle the cost of additional devices, offering some kind of device as a service offering, which is something that Deutsche Telekom does. So those are kind of what we're thinking around the work from home opportunity. I, I think I'll, I'll stop here and see if Annette and Lisa have any, any thoughts on this. I know Lisa, it's not, and maybe not your guys' core area of focus, but what your thoughts are on this opportunity. But um, as I mentioned before, Amy, I think, uh, as you said, uh, the connectivity as such is not that big of an issue in the Nordics, um, at least not what I've seen. Uh, we have good quality and so forth. But, I, but for me, it's, it's more about the converging offering between, as you say here, the consumer part and the, the B2B part, where you as a company want to provide a full, full solution for your employees and how much of the home environment should be actually subsidized via your company. So making those kind of bundle and packages, uh, I think is one area to exploit. And also, as you mentioned, setting up the devices. And, 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 and I think that is, that is something that we all as, as telco operators have a challenge and to, to become much, much more be better is the implementation and the, the, the experience of setting up your services and, and get going with them, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. And do you guys do, do you guys do things already like um, intelligent networking in the home where you can do a mesh network that makes sure that you're getting the right coverage for the right devices in the right parts of the house? Uh, yeah, we 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 have uh, uh, we actually have an initiative going uh, on right now that that's called Smart Wi-Fi, which uh, mm -hmm. enables a more easier setup in the home. But it's still on an early early phase, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so we are looking into, especially when it comes to you know setting up the Wi-Fi and the mesh and everything and making that work because it, it's not really easy today. It's not plug and play. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I would I would just add that even if uh, or we are looking at the international digital services only, but as this is such a huge problem for operators, so that's basically where we uh, invented our Elisa Automate business. And uh, for us, it means that there's thousands of parameters that you need to optimize during the day 
and uh, COVID especially was a very good example of that all the old automation systems that were stable so they didn't anymore work as or function as people were staying in ho homes and they were commuting in different times than earlier so you really need to have the the full automation that will react to the uh, changing of the different loads and uh, mm -hmm. uh, as you were asking about the mesh network so for every operator the end user experience is the king and i really would love us to be there to be able to observe and monitor the end user experience so that we would know that while there's a heavy traffic in teenagers room also the parents can do their remote working yeah exactly and i think that's what we're talking about is you know being able to make that easy for the home worker um and, and easy to buy for the enterprise. Uh, and we're seeing some examples, um, you know, in terms of that proposition, like Talk Talk does a good one in, in the UK. And there are a few coming out, but I think there's a lot of room for this to be a smoother, more holistic service um, for the end users. So that's kind of one that's, uh, you know, close to the core for telecoms operators. The other one, digital health, is further from the core. And I think that makes it more difficult, right? We know that healthcare is a big part of the economy, a big expenditure in every operator's local market. It's a nationalized market, so there's good, you know, it's it's a it's a more national market. Um, so they're not competing at a at an international uh, level, and so there are you know many opportunities for telecoms operators in healthcare, but it is further away from the core, and therefore longer to build, more difficult to figure out how to get there. Um, but we still think it's a good opportunity, you know, particularly because um, healthcare providers in their local markets are looking for a reliable, secure, trusted local partner um, that has, you know, distribution and access uh, within their markets and the fundamental connectivity that is necessary to, to implement a lot of the digital health applications. Um, so there are a lot of good reasons why telcos might think about it. And this is an area that STL has looked at a lot. Um, and I, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but what we've done is we've thought about what are the key application areas where we think telecoms operators could bring value to the digital health market. And these are the four um, primary ones that we're looking at. So diagnostics and triage, and that's you know, trying to understand you know, what services does the patient need um, before bringing them to into the healthcare market, you know, really understanding what their issue is and diagnosing it more quickly. Um, virtual care and telemedicine, and that's, you know, evolve, seen that accelerate during COVID, you know, use of um, video consultations or online appointment bookings or online prescriptions and different markets are at different levels of um, uh, maturity around this stuff. Then we have remote monitoring, which is, you know, monitoring patients with chronic disease, um, who have just come out of hospital, elderly people um, who uh, can you know, monitor their vital signs in order to deliver more preventative care to them. And then finally, there's kind of the high level data analytics. And we're thinking you know, not, not specifically the kind of data and analytics that might be integrated into a remote monitoring solution, but something more high level where you're looking at a population level analysis to inform policy making or um, you know, to, to ensure to look at major health trends across, across your um, country. And what we did is we've done some modeling to understand how is this market changing. We all, we all know that in COVID there's been a big boost in uptake of digital health services and that makes the market more attractive, makes it um, more mature and you know a lot of the challenges in healthcare has been that you know getting people to use this stuff, you know breaking down the organizational and regulatory barriers to using digital health services and a lot of those have been broken down and so on the left hand side, what you've seen is we've modeled the total potential savings from integration of digital health um, applications into these four areas. And we modeled that against 14 use cases in these four areas. Uh, and so it's, it's a small part of the overall healthcare market, but ones that we think are relevant for telecoms operators. And the blue bar on the left is showing the potential value, cost savings from use of digital health services in the app, these applications post COVID, since COVID has increased penetration and uptake. And the yellow line is showing 
what it would have been in the base case before COVID happened. And the differential that you see is that this market has basically been accelerated by about four years. And you know, the potential cost savings that this market can deliver is you know, now 700 billion instead of three and a bit hundred billion. So this is really accelerating this market. And that means that if telcos want to play a role in it, now is the time to act. It's gonna take a few years to build this business to figure out how you're gonna play. And so now is the time to do it. And on the right hand side is just thinking about, well, okay, this is the overall market. Where in this market is the biggest value bucket? You know, And there's been a lot of excitement around stuff like virtual care and video consultations. But the reality is that, especially in developed markets, um, there's a limit to how much value that can deliver. It still uses the doctor's time to see the patient. Um, and it increases access for people in rural areas or you know, people who don't have access, but it doesn't fundamentally change the cost structure that much for delivering a care to a patient. But diagnostics and triage can help to avoid a lot of unnecessary appointments and remote monitoring likewise can help deliver preventative care so you don't have to go to the doctor and then you really save time. You don't have to go to the emergency room and you really save time. And so this is some of our thinking around, this is a really big market and we're trying to understand where the, where the value buckets are and how they're growing over time. The challenge for telcos is then to figure out where they're gonna play. And we've done some analysis of some different strategies that telecoms operators can play, but the reality is that you know, it's, it's true, it's a, it's a tough market and you can't, just, you can't just pick and choose a couple of bits of the healthcare market because then you won't understand the pain points of the end user. And although these are four application areas, on the patient journey, they're all tied together. And so you have to think about that when you're playing in healthcare. So it's not an easy win, despite being a really potentially big win if telcos can play it right. So I don't know, uh, Annette and, and Lisa, whether you have any comments on, on this one. Annette, I know that you guys have, have some done some work in healthcare. What are your thoughts? No, but you're, you're, uh, you're right. We, we've taken the angle, as, as you've mentioned here, Amy, to understand where the, the biggest cost savings are and realize that the, for the remote patient monitoring, that is a huge area for saving costs because you could actually prevent people coming into the hospitals and so forth. Yeah. So, and, and the chronic diseases is, is a huge cost driver for, for healthcare sector. So we're actually starting to explore that field with, with, a, with an application service uh, providing a digital solution for, for chronic diseases such as mm -hmm. diabetes and heart disease and so forth. Um, yeah. the, the challenge with the healthcare sector as such is, is uh, as you also mentioned, um, is the digitalization process of that of that industry is very slow. I mean, it's it's dependent on on political decisions and the the purchasing uh, are very controlled and regular. Uh, um, there are regulatory issues regarding it and so forth. So. Uh, if, if you want to go into this this uh, sector, you, you need to have patience and, and a lot of resilience, I would say, uh, yeah. because uh, it will take time before you actually th this market will take off. But once it does, I think I see great potential in this market, actually. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's a challenge to understand if, if as you say, it's a local play. And uh, although you could maybe scale up on more of the technology platform it's yeah. still a very much local play i would say understanding the healthcare sectors within each of the markets mm -hmm. so i think what we are evaluating now is kind of is is it scalable enough <laughs> for the nordic yeah. and the Baltics where we actually are positioned at the moment so that's yeah. a balance that we need to evaluate yeah on a regular basis but we are what we are doing now is to actually find partnerships so that we don't have to build and, and uh, even go to market completely on our own so we can use and build an ecosystem around it actually to, yeah. to make it more scalable yeah 100 percent. and i think that's the technology of how you deliver remote monitoring that is a global technology yeah. the implementation is local so you need those partners yeah. you can't compete on the technology 
layer, maybe in a couple of areas, but not really. You need those partners. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that now we get into the meat of it and uh, have a discussion with Annette and Lisa, you uh, more particularly about their um, experiences. And so these are the key questions we're looking at, but you know, from the audience, do, do submit yours um, as well, and we'll take them as we go along. Um, so I think the, the first one, um, and, and Lisa, we haven't heard much from you yet, so let's start with you. Can you tell me how, how do you guys choose what you should focus on? You know, where, how do you make that decision in Elisa? Yeah, the, I could speak an hour about this one, but we, of course, we do the same as the others. We scan the market, we understand the trends, we seek for ideas, but I think the key thing for us is to uh, talk to the customers and understand if the need is there right now. So very often customers say that, yes, I want to have this, this is important, but are they willing to invest their time and money for the solution? So that is the kind of crucial part. We have a funnel of ideas and we have a process of running those ideas to uh, pre-startups and then growing them into startups and then scaling them. And uh, there is a kind of clear rules on how we do that with a very limited team first and then uh, growing the team if there is attraction in the market and giving them more financing. So very much like the startup way of uh, seeking for investments. And, uh, and uh, I would still add in here that the brutal honesty is the thing that you should be looking for evidence why not to do it instead of why should we do it. So this in short, perhaps. Mm. And how long did it take you to sort of um, formalize this process of your startup funnel and, you know, figuring out when to move things through through the funnel or kill them? Yeah, I would say that uh, 11 years when I started, we had the entertainment service and I, my first was ebooks. And um, and there was a lot. There were a lot of learnings uh, on the way. But I think now we have kept it quite unchanged uh, for three, four years. And when I say unchanged, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be adapting. So I think that I've learned already during this month something new that we should have as a rule in the funnel. So it's an evolving evolving process also. Uh, a startup of its own, the, the how we do it, but the basics are still there. Sandboxing, mm -hmm. I would still mention. So there needs to be a clear sandbox money so that not uh, the, any of the savings that we telcos might some sometime have, so they would not cut the innovation, but it should have its own sandbox. Hmm. And how does this compare with your experience uh, in Division X? No, I, it I, it resembles a lot uh, on how how we go about this. It's a lot about finding, you know, the customer pain points, the customer needs, and to verify those very quickly in the process by, you know, quickly prototyping and testing it off in the market. Uh, but to add to, to Lisa's comment is also that I think for Division X, especially uh, within TLA, we are very close to to the core business so so we really need to understand that there's a true and close connection to the core and that we actually have a reason to play so the strategic mm -hmm. fit and, and kind of what kind of capability fit they are so that what can make telia unique within this arena is also very important when we evaluate uh, what bets to actually mm -hmm. follow i would say and when you're defining the core, what do you mean? Is that capabilities, assets? Yeah. What are the kinds of core things you're you're drawing on? No, it's it's both the 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 brand. I would say the brand position. Uh, one reason for going into healthcare is kind of that we have a very strong brand, especially in Sweden, where we are very much connected to like you know trust and and robustness and and so forth. So that's one one part of the core, I would say. And of course, the, the capabilities with the infrastructure and the connectivity and, and all the 
um, the processes that we are are uh, best at, so to say. Mm. That's part of the core, I would say. And does that? And, and who knows what will become the core in the future? I I see that may, may, many of the things we are building now will be part of the core in the future, of course. But 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 that is at least the distinction we make right now. Hmm. So which things do you think could become part of the core in the future? Which ones do you see having the strongest um, long-term opportunity? No, but I see, I see um, the, the two or the one biggest bet for, for Division X right now, it's not that much new, but still a growing field, it's, it's the IoT uh, space. And, and uh, it's, um, as I said, still growing market and we are still exploring how we actually could build more value on top of the connectivity. Uh, mm -hmm. So we are moving up the value chain. And with that, I would say that the the insights and the data that we could collide from IoT will be kind of the the, um, the future way to position and actually capturing more value and differentiate on IoT in the future, I would say. And mm. for me, that is very much part of core and will be an extension of core in the future. Yeah. So yeah, I could comment that also a little bit, uh, what we have been discussing earlier as well, is that we realized, I think both of us with Annette, we have done through the period of that e-wallet is not core to operators. No. Mm -hmm. And there, the reason perhaps was that the infrastructure wasn't there yet, and it's hardly evolving now. And also, we had gaming earlier, but we realized that uh, it's very much about creativity, and uh, we were not. That's what where we wanted to focus. So that's why we uh, sold that or exited that one as well. And uh, what we think is uh, very. Uh, close to our core and as you said Annette that what might be in the future so smart, smart factory supply chain industrial uh, digital industrial services those are close to our core now and there we see that all the capabilities that we have done as an operator or to automize optimize monitor those are needed in in the kind of industry sector at the time being and uh, I really hope that this will be as potential for us as it looks like now. Mm. And I mean, one of the challenges for you, Lisa, in that in terms of this being close to your core is that the market is an international one. So how did you guys go about sort of deciding that you were going to play internationally? And, you know, what are the what are what are the challenges and that is involved in that or that is required to, to address in order to be able to play internationally you know what would you recommend to other telcos thinking about that approach yeah and uh, especially uh, then it gets even to closer to core that what are you really good at when doing something and as to telcos if we really had the highest consumption of uh, data I would say in Finland, but of course in Nordics as well. I think that we are still the highest. So that, and then we were able to automate our network so that there basically is no manual manual work done in there. So it's kind of, in a way, easy to understand that there is something that we might be able to help the others as well. And that's where where we started doing that. And and. Uh, and I, I think it was pretty easy to get the doors opened to other telcos as being a telco. And mm. um, so, yeah, my, my advice is that make sure that it's really close to your core. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going international, it has to be even closer to your really, okay, good. Um, I think there's so huge potential there, Lisa, actually, on uh, as. Uh, we we have discussed earlier is the collaboration between uh, operators and how we actually can share our core capabilities in a better way to be able to compete with the hyperscalers and so forth and we we are actually uh, trying to set up the, these uh, at least dialogues with other operators to see if there are platforms that we could share and and learnings that we could share uh, together yeah. 
Yeah, mm. that, that's a really something that should be discussed more, that we have been so competing on our own markets and uh, perhaps not uh, doing it or using each others as partners. So we've been, we have been looking at other partners outside telcos perhaps yeah. too much. Mm. I mean, I know this is something that um, TELUS has discussed a lot in the healthcare market and, and the challenge is, you know, lots of telcos have not committed to healthcare and so it's been difficult to collaborate on a platform level internationally but mm. I can see in some discrete areas that there could be opportunity if you know among like-minded operators you know that have similar similar focuses to 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 share resources but yeah and especially to the healthcare um as as you know that we didn't uh, continue with that one of course in uh, in finland we do but internationally it was exactly the regulation in different markets so we were testing in sweden <laughs> and uh, which, which was really close to us but still the regulation and the long sales processes and not having enough contacts and you really need to be inside the market local play as you said so mm -hmm. uh, how to make sure that you have enough the right connection so you need to have partners hmm yeah so i want to backtrack a little bit to this idea of you know the international versus the the local and the you know new business versus the core um and i know both of you have experience both you know sort of in the, in the core business innovation and in innovating out you know further away from the core is there any any difference in the process that you would use in Division X than you would use to, you know, innovate on your existing consumer enterprise services or, or Lisa, do you use different processes in the international di digital services business than you do in your consumer enterprise business units in Finland and Estonia? The kind of the key components are the same, but I, I think the biggest difference is that uh, as to the Finland, we have so much more data on the people. It's so much easier for us to, uh, well, uh, to mention one uh, tool that we use. We have a panel of people and we just drop in their ideas that how would you like this one? And they comment very quickly that too expensive, not good for us, add this one, this feature so much easier to check if that's interesting for them and also looking at all the data that we you know how much there is data but when mm -hmm. you get to the international markets you you don't have that and that's why i think the biggest difference is that uh, for the international market uh, it will not happen unless you decide that it will happen and there we get again to the sandboxing of money and also i think having the best leaders in, in the company to run that because it's uh, it's extremely difficult that's why we had also the x as experimenting in, in extreme uncertainties and uh, so i think that uh, they decide to do something internationally sandbox the money and be very prudent on the processes because the domestic business will anyway uh, because of the wrong uh, kind of uh, lots of strategy work uh, that is being done in there and all the NPS and all the customer feedback so there is a need and must to do that mm. but for international you you need to be very tough on 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 that sector what about you Annette do you do you think there's any differences from your perspective and well, I think it, it's a different mindset, uh, I would say, uh, for in two, two dimensions. <laughs> uh, within Division X, we, we, um, we work more with kind of what we call the augmenting innovation or even disruptive innovation, where we try to kind of prepare for the future and challenge the core and the core business a bit, whereas the innovation within the core is more about optimizing and, and, and some time augmenting maybe. Uh, so there's a difference there of maybe more being more challenging in the approach. But then also uh, when it comes to this national international aspect of it, I think uh, we see it more as a, a global play for all our services. Uh, although Telia has, a, has an ambition on the Nordic and Baltics uh, as, as as our focus and our footprint but uh, since we are working mainly with digital services 
they they have the potential to scale on a global level i would say so we don't we are not necessarily only you know focusing on one market we are we are scaling to 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 the potential of going global on although that is not the ambition of course but mm. um and and that's where actually the partnerships cross the borders with other telcos come in uh, because i see a way to scale global is also to 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 enable these services to be licensed or via partnerships or something uh, to other opcos uh, because they are global they are digital you can use them in any market uh, uh, so to say hmm. so yeah. i think it's more of a mental shift uh, because in the core business it's we are all very much you know aligned across the countries and it's very much a local play i would say hmm. yeah thank you um so the next question i would like to explore a little bit is how do you scale these businesses you know once you have a new idea it's gained some traction you're starting to grow what's what's the strategy for scaling how do you go about that i know lisa you guys have a very um you have a very clear approach to that so maybe you can start yeah, it took quite a while to have the clear approach. But no, nowadays we think that the, when we see that there's traction, that we really have something unique and yeah. the customers are willing to pay for that. So that's the moment when we, or even earlier, we start to look for companies to buy. And uh, so instead of trying to get uh, 50 more customers where the sales processes are usually really slow, in operators or with operators and with enterprises as well so if we find matches as we have done now with camline and polystar the two companies that we are we have acquired so that is really what we are looking for but of course it's possible to uh, grow organically as well but uh, uh, that is much tougher so if there is an m a company who already has got a little bit of scale so we would try mm -hmm. to re kind of get that company. Okay, and that's the sort of at the beginning, even if you have some customers, you can see there's demand in the market, but there are no companies. That's kind of, that's a, a kind of veto criteria for pursuing that opportunity. Yeah, well, in a way we, I used to run a business called Binge, which was entertaining, entertaining business as a service. And mm -hmm. that we failed or exited. And I'm really sorry for that because there was such a nice organic growth and really nice customers waiting. But there the reason was that there wasn't any companies to acquire. But that mm -hmm. was a new business branch for us or business area. But now when we are inside the, uh, let's say, automation business and the in, uh, industry business, there we can, of course, uh, grow by organically as well, because we have the sales channels. We, we have mm -hmm. already the, the people who are talking to the right companies. So there the kind of the demand for M&A is not that big, but of course it helps a lot. Hmm, I understand. So it's a little bit of balance, balancing a, a few different criteria there. Annette, do yes. you guys have do you guys have a similar, you know, idea of how you how you scale out, what trajectory, you know, what criteria you work by? Yeah, um I mean, of course, it's a constant evaluation on on, on again the the growth potential and the the the, the market fit uh, and also the strategic fit and the capability fit that we evaluate constantly. But mm -hmm. once we got that fit and the potential clear for us, uh, we we do have a, a scaling agenda, so to say. Uh, sometimes we actually done m as but I think I see that the greatest potential we have is when we can start combining the core services with those new bets. And we've seen good traction on that now with IoT, for instance, where we actually can, can give a, a full platter of, of different solutions, combining you know, mobile connectivity, fixed connectivity, and IoT solutions uh, on top. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the best, absolutely the best way to scale. And, and we work closely with, with the country opcos 
uh, to get uh, these uh, offerings out in the markets because we have a huge potential with the existing customer base that we already have to be able to scale new bets. Mm. And a similar way of, of doing those uh, deals also with the, the B2C bets that we have. Uh, so both B2B and B2C, I would say. Mm. So that's one scaling through our, our existing core is, is one. And, and then the other, I would say, is uh, through partnerships so mm -hmm. that we could use partners as a way to get access to new uh, customer bases, new verticals, uh, both in, in terms of go-to-market partners, but also solution partners that could build capabilities and applications on top of our, our platforms uh, to make more relevant use cases and, and, and propositions towards the, the customers. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's always a tough, a difficult one. And I know we didn't discuss this before, so uh, putting you on the spot a little, a little bit here, but one of the questions that we get a lot when we're speaking to, to operators around the world that are, you know, doing this new business and they have the same thought processes, you know, the same strategy as you and it, where, you know, let's focus on things that can enhance our core and, you know, we can build a business that enhances our existing connectivity revenues. And then how, but how do you measure the KPIs uh, or the success rate, right? Because I think that, you know, a lot of that is like, are, are we measuring the, the revenue from our core services or revenue from the new services? And the new services obviously are you know, different type of revenue compared to the core services. Do you guys have a, a way of handling that? Have you managed, you know, have you managed to overcome that challenge at all? Uh, I wouldn't say of, overcome it <laughs> yet. It's it's still a, a, a challenge that we need to to um, work on. I would say, but yeah. we are actually measuring both the direct value that we bring because. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are substantial direct uh, revenues and, and, and value that we bring, but yeah. then, of course, more importantly, is the indirect value that these uh, yeah. new bets could add. And we are meshing that in terms of, you know, indirect revenues that we create with this bundle offerings, of course, uh, where you could actually win new customers or actually upgrade customers so that they actually be more they become more loyal to us and of course reducing churn and, and, and so forth so there are several different dimensions that we could track and and, and yeah. value uh, evaluate but of course yeah we could be be better at this i see i think uh, yeah. but at least we're starting to we're getting there i would say yeah yeah i would Lisa, is give this a challenge yeah, you go. yeah, I would give it. Yeah, I was just going to think that I would give a totally different answer, but I'm more looking at the very early stages of the funnel. So it's about learning for us. And that has been really a long journey to talk to the CFOs, which I used to be as well. And that's uh, why um, that, that's why we call it a scientific method. So it's really an uh, Excel template where you fill in all the the experiments that you are doing and you have a kind of baseline and then you measure and then you see what you learned and uh, that's the only way according to lean startup community to and to my understanding to kind of fight against the revenue targets at the very beginning so it's really like a crime stories where you have the uh, somebody bringing the evidence in the courtroom and showing that i see attraction in here so that that's what we are doing and we try to fail early so burn rate is the thing so keep your costs low and you will have a long time to experiment if you scale too early you will kill, kill your baby at the very early stages so i have a uh, a question from the audience which i think kind of um touches on this a, a little bit and and the question from mark is what role does internal cultural and skills transformation play in scaling innovation and and leveraging these new partnerships that you're trying to form any takers big role i would say <laughs> it's hard to 
to to measure it but you know it's um absolutely a big role i would say because and and going back to to lisa's comment there on on you know how you measure and track and it, it's i mean the, the the greatest challenge regarding new bets and innovation and so forth is the governance model because if you're trying to track that and measure that in 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 a traditional you know um traditional telco core manner uh that that's hard uh so and that's part of the culture i would say so mm. yeah i think it's very important to have more of a growth mindset fail fast fail early mindset and understanding that these innovation bets are completely different and should be tracked and measured in a different way Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree totally. And uh, I think that at the very beginning, like 2017, we, we were trying to hunt the right minded people out from El Elisa and uh, kind of the ones who wouldn't try to scale very quickly, but who would be very prudent on the trying the the customer feedback for that. But I think nowadays we are even have been successful in uh, kind of scaling that ment mentality inside the corporation and there's a lot of experiments ongoing in the traditional business as well and I think that they are doing excellent things there as well but the problem is of course the time when you need to deliver and then experiment at the same time so it's hard to split have two separate roles in a way it's easier when you have only one role which is to find yeah. uh, product mm. market fit or growth. Mm. Mm. And so do you think you really need, like you need the carved out innovation roles because it's very difficult for people to carve out that time um, from their from their existing roles? That That's that was, our thinking today, yes. Yeah, and that was kind of the reason we actually uh, created the Vision X unit uh, because of otherwise there's a risk that these growth bets that needs special attention to be able to yeah. grow and scale uh, they will be totally buried uh, in yeah. in the, the core because it, there you you are constantly chasing you know the next quarter and making sure that you are yeah. um you know um according to your targets and so forth so so i think it's necessary to have it separate actually mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, very well integrated. Uh, at least for mm -hmm. us, that's important because we don't want to have bets that's completely off our core. <laughs> uh, yeah. Since we have a mission to actually augment them and prepare TLA for the future. Hmm. And did you do the same? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. I was just kind of going to comment that I think that it's vital for every telco in even in the domestic market to listen to the customers to have enough time this is kind of no brainer but mm -hmm. uh, to have find time so in a way i think there's a great need to sandbox some time from each people that they would have the time to really listen and instead of just thinking that this is how the how it goes but we we are living in the digital world where every moment every insight counts mm. and Annette when did you guys when you were you know building up Division X did you do a similar thing to Elisa and go and hunt out the people who might be the best for looking at innovation opportunities or did you hire from the externally how did you go about that um well, that's a good question, Amy, because I'm fairly new to TLA, so I don't have that that track record, and um, I wasn't part of building uh, Division yeah. X. I can't take yeah. you know the the honor for that. Um, but I guess it was a mix uh, of actually finding people both from from the core uh, that was had had a growth mindset, uh, and also acquiring new people that have had the more the agile way of working, the more the digital mindset and so forth. So I think it was a combination. Mm -hmm. But, but um, sorry to say, you need to, to ask that question to someone who has a bit more history in Italy. Fair enough, fair enough. Amy, um, I, yeah. I just think that I think everybody can be an innovator. So don't take me wrong on that yeah. one, that it needs to be special people. I think everybody can do it, but it's about the time 
that it's given yeah. to the person to do that. Yeah, yeah. So they need that dedicated time to be able to do it. Um, so I want to finish on a question which will kind of set the scene for our next uh, session tomorrow, which is that from your guys' opinion, do you think that 5G um, and the current, you know, virtualization transformation that telecoms operators are going through changes the landscape, brings up, are there any new opportunities, particularly related to, to 5G that you think are, are worth noting or worth looking at? Well, I don't. I don't have like. Uh, I think there's there's not a silver bullet here. Uh, my 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 main comment on this one is that I hope that we as telcos, uh, we that we don't make the same mistake that we've done previously with 3G and 4G and all these new generation networks that comes along. Uh, we 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 tend to just push it out in the market and just assume that people are willing to pay more for more ca more capacity yeah. instead of actually taking it the other way around, understanding the customer pain point, understanding the customer needs and seeing the technology as an enabler to actually fulfill that need. Uh, so I think for 5G especially, I think we need to have much more use case approach to that instead of just assuming that we could charge more because it's more capacity in the network so to say uh, i've seen that many times before and i've seen some trends in the market right now where people are uh, seeing this this potential but i think we really need to to get down to the customer problem and trying to solve them instead of doing the other way around hmm. Yeah, and I, I see. Yeah, there, there, I think we all see lots of beautiful cases, but the problem is that what, what is hype and where, where is the timing? Uh, timing yeah. is from just now. I think for us, it's very incremental growth. We know that uh, the 5G G will increase the uh, complexity in the network and all the unlimited pricing uh, models and the data hungry customers. Uh, they will, and at the same time, the OPEX CAPEX pressure that operators are having. So that there is a play for us, at least in the automation, the networks, and also the same goes for the industrial side. Mm -hmm. 5G is driving market growth in, yeah. in that. Yeah, so I can see obviously clearly related to some of the plays, uh, Elisa already has, but, but from Matilia perspective, it's really, you know, it sounds to me like you're really going to have to leverage those partnerships that you're building in different areas if you're going to take the use case approach then that will be the key you won't be able to develop all of those use cases yeah. yourself so it will really be about how well you can partner and i see that iot will be a, a great enabler for real uh, implementing and and uh, and realizing those those uh, use cases uh, 5g use, use cases so mm. It goes hand in hand. Say. Great. Well, with that, we are coming up to the top of our hours. So thank you so much, Annette and Lisa, for joining me today. It's been really interesting and you know, great to hear about you know how you guys are approaching innovation in your in your businesses. Um so yeah, thank you very much and I hope everyone enjoyed the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, bye.